well, I'm not a chemist, and uh, I dare say, you know, these things, it's dangerous because these things use reactive solvents and stuff like that. It's possible that out of the same set of plants that the uh, ayahuasca analogs can be prepared, that it you could concentrate DMT out of Desmanthus elenoiensis or Socotria or Phalaris or something like that. For those of us who aren't second year students in biochemistry, this is probably uh, the way to go. The other way to go is to try and find a chemist and inspire them to make it. I mean, I know it's not a terribly satisfying answer, but on the other hand, if there were a terribly satisfying answer, there wouldn't be the question, would they? I'm talking about concentrating it in methods. You soak it, boil it, dry off the water. Well, no, the way you would do it if you were serious is you would get a piece of apparatus called a soxlet extractor, S-O-X-L-E-T, is a piece of chemical glassware and the way it works is it has a bulb uh, you you hook it you plug it in through a ground glass fit and you plug it into your solvent uh, vessel which is sitting on a heater and it vaporizes the solvent the solvent is carried through a tube past the soxlet and up into a, a uh, condenser the salt and then liquefies, it drips down onto the sample, which is in a little thing which looks sort of like a, a condom or a toilet paper tube or something. Anyway, it's a, a cylinder with a round end that you pack with the sample that you're extracting. And the Soxlet, which was undoubtedly designed in Germany uh, by somebody very clever, uh, the hot solvent falls on the sample and the sample gets more and more immersed in the solvent. Well, then when the solvent is above the level of the little uh, sample holding filter tube, there's a, little, there's a little pipe on the side of the solvent which leads back down into the vessel on the heater and a kind of siphon automatically cuts in. It's a passive thing. It's just how it's designed. And the the hot solvent, it goes and it just sucks all the solvent off the sample and drops it back in the lower flask. And then the hot solvent begins pure. No no nothing is dissolved in it because you know when it when the solvent vaporizes it to leaves all the other materials behind and you run this they call it refluxing you reflux the sample for two or three hours and at the end of that time you can be fairly confident if you chosen your solvent correctly that 99 percent of what was in uh is now down in the solvent flask and then you just unhook the solvent flask from the apparatus, take that and evaporate it. And then you get a pure, a, this is called, uh, the liquid then in the flask is called the mother liquor. It is a whole alkaloid extract. Every alkaloid in the sample is now in solution in this stuff. And then you can either simply drive the solvent off and you'll get a, a, probably a dark brown, reddish brown tar of some sort that you can smoke. Or if you really are a, um, a, um, a. <laughs> wow. I saw a guy smoke DMT in the forest in Hawaii, and one of these metallic bugs came and hovered right over him wow. for the entire trip. Anyway, you can then you have this red tar which you can smoke, but if you want only the DMT and want to separate it from the other alkaloids, then there's a further series of steps, which is you get um, um, chromatography paper 
you you know what this is and you you uh pour the solvent into like a petri dish suspend the chromatography paper so that it just touches the solvent and you all know and understand the principles of chromatography you see the wick up a certain yes it wicks up through the paper which is very porous and compounds of different molecular weights will deposit themselves at different levels in the in the chromatography paper and then with an ultraviolet light or sometimes you can tell with your naked eye it depends on what you're looking for the DMT will all like like say the DET will be at three and a half inches the DMT will be at four inches the monomethyl DMT will be above that in other words they fractionate out and then what you you do this and you save your chromatography papers and then when you've il- when you um used up all your mother liquor in this way then you take a pair of scissors and you go through and you cut out the inch wide strip where all the dmt located in the filter paper and so then you get a, a bunch of little pieces of paper which have are saturated in dmt now you put them in a, a clean um, this thing, this condom-like uh, filter. It looks like a bullet. Uh, you put your chroma- the little sheets of chromatography paper in there, run a solvent through that, and this time when you evaporate off the solvent, you will get uh, a pure enough compound for... for uh, your purposes. I mean, it will be 98, 99% pure DMT. I mean, this may sound like a lot of hassle, but on the other hand, we're talking about the key to the mysteries of life and death here. Mm-hmm. So the effort doesn't seem too heroic. I'm talking about a solvent. How do you know what solvent can we use? Well, um, you, you can look this up in a standard chemistry book. Uh, the cautionary word here is that high molecular weight solvents are flammable. Uh, chloroform, ether, use these things very carefully and always in an open and well-ventilated place. And for God's sake, don't heat your flask on a gas stove. No open flames allowed. Use the, a hot plate or something like that. Professional chemists have what are called bird nest heaters, which are these things which look like bird nests of various sizes that the the flask of solvent just very nicely snuggles down into the bird nest heater and make sure that there are no ungrounded electrical connections around. Ideally, it should be done outside where the moving air can disperse the solvent. You don't want to make a fuel of yourself. <laughs> You said this morning, uh, if since DMT is so difficult to get, that psilocybin, uh, if you have more than eight grams or eight gram at least, that you would get a similar or the same effect. Did I understand? Well, I said that sometimes on high dose psilocybin, sitting in darkness, breathing and you know working it, massaging it over hours, you can break in to these places. But of course. There's a number of extraneous issues here. You have to... The one thing about the DMT flash is that it's mercifully quick. Mm -hmm. So there isn't any time to panic or begin to think about the implications of it. It's just a white-knuckle trip through it, and then you're out. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think... I mean, my technique is to try and inspire chemists to make it. You know, and I always tell people, people say, where do you get it? I always say, when you find it, call me first. (laughs) And I to chemists, I say, you know, when you make it, call me first. And I think this will, uh, this is an effective method for those of us who aren't uh, inspired biochemists. They want us to uh, somehow, under the influence of 
DMT and to a lesser degree psilocybin, they want us to experiment with language. Hmm. They want us to, I, you know, I mean, this is just my intuition, but I think that we're, you know, yesterday at the end, we were talking about how we're on the brink of an ontological transformation of language from something seen to something beheld. I think that we there's some kind of coalescence of the linguistic intent that they want to catalyze. The way I think of these psychedelic compounds is that they are enzymes which catalyze the imagination. Uh, a catalyst, you know, is uh, uh, something which you add to a chemical reaction to speed it up. And I think, you know, that uh, consciousness might well have evolved out of higher hominids given 30, 40, 50 million years, but it happened in two million years. And to account for that, I think we have to look for a catalyst of the imagination. And that's what these things do. I mean, they give your mind becomes a much more powerful tool for the forming of associations, for the producing of imagery, for, I mean, your mind becomes like the discriminating wisdom of the sword of Manjushri. You're just able to cut through Consciousness expansion is what these things were associated with. And, uh, and I, you know, I say in my talks, co it's absence of consciousness that is killing the planet. So if there's something that we can do to accelerate our consciousness, then it seems to me there's almost a moral and political obligation to do that. Well, one thing that I find interesting is that in, in the Amazon of Muskrat, literally Shinwood's Ayahuasquitos, what the visuals they have no doubt in the mind that is a um, that, that is a peak of the spirit world but there's a because the least is a habit of the spirit spirit speaking spirit or whatever, like self warm itself. And he was gonna go to soft the Shafina Wask and he said with his eyes of uh, beautiful was that was lowering like fool, riding on a forest or walk on top of water. And um, she's telling him where to go, but it's like, but this and that. But, um, and he was saying that was a coolie wad when water and gold, the spirit of gold. And I'm just thinking that other, other uh, young people that had the trip, and it wasn't to say that, that they're good for top all of this here, covered, grass are covered. You don't see more like the invasions that the, the mass fire was, you know, see, which are you deep, like it was saying, you know, beautiful visions of, of what well, spirits telling me kings, this, that. And our, maybe it, maybe it's maybe the fasting and the initiation that boy that the that the machines and I was going to go up to you in order to get to but when they can see these wonderful things is is um, maybe preparing the body be set enough to receive like to be able to get into that state of um, lower concentrations of of DMT maybe it's because we have we got that initiation or that our bodies are are subby um. And adapted to that, that, that we really need a higher dose or, or whatever concentration. But that I think that's that, I think it's um like you know maybe maybe what what they have developed in order to get to the point to see these things is some point or another like throwing the body to be able to see get into that state with you know with the with the concentrations of this bowl and hail me to them. Yeah, I think. Well, I, it's not something I think. It, it's so that the body is an incredibly sensitive and delicate instrument for interacting with the world. For instance, uh, an example that I like to use, some of you may remember from when you were children, if you got a really good chemistry set, there would be a thing in it called a spintharoscope. Do you all know what a spintharoscope mm -hmm. is? You could make one of these. They're really neat. You could make one. This seems to be the metaphor of the morning. You could make one with the paper tube from the inside of a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> what a spintharoscope is, is it's a, it's a little pipe 
usually no longer than this. And in one end, it has a lens. And in the other end, it has a painted phosphorus screen, like a television set, but just a little piece of cardboard that's got a, some phosphorus painted on it. And right in front of the phosphorus screen is a, a needle, which has been dipped in airplane glue. And then the end of the needle has been rolled in the kind of radium that is on a glow-in-the-dark watch, you know? So what you do with the spintharoscope is you go into a closet and close the door and you sit in darkness for about 10 minutes. And then you look into the spintharoscope and lo and behold, it looks like twinkling stars. You see little flashes of light randomly on the other end of the spintharoscope. These are, get this, single photons of light because the radiation from the radium is striking the phosphorus screen and kicking out single photons from, uh, from the phosphorus. This is you, you, you sitting here, 145 pounds of meat, are looking right at single photons coming into existence. You're looking into the quantum realm. Now, they've also done experiments where, in a special kind of apparatus, they can, uh, uh, I don't know how they keep the eardrum from bursting, but they, they evacuate air from the ear, and then they can release a single oxygen molecule into the ear, and you can actually hear it bumping against the tympanic membrane. Well, so these kinds of experiments are by way of example that the human body is an instrument with a range of ability that reaches from the quantum mechanical foundations of matter up to when you look through a large telescope out into the galaxy, you know, you can physically have light fall on your eyes that has been traveling for four or five billion years. So the human body is an incredibly advanced instrument for the exploration of nature. And we have, you know, we think you can't learn anything about quantum physics unless you build an instrument 17 kilometers in diameter that costs $100 billion and provides pork barrel for 20 years for a bunch of weasel politicians. This is just because of our obsession with instrumentality. But what the shaman knows is that the human body is a superb instrument for, for doing this kind of thing. And that's why I take, I think the models of reality that emerge out of shamanism are equally on a par with the crowd that's seeking the, you know, the, the top Quark and all that other stuff. I mean, these things are pretty airy fairy stuff, uh, and usually the argument for them rests on the fiat of some fishy formula. So, uh, uh, part of the whole thing about psychedelics, I think, is, and I hammer on this all the time, is what I call reclaiming the felt presence of immediate experience. This is what you are. You are not Time Magazine or National Public Radio or any of this stuff. The felt presence of immediate experience here, now. Everything else is rumor, innuendo, illusion, factual ricochet. And, and uh, we as a culture have completely sold ourselves out I mean, we all run around with the idea, little me, what do I know? The guys at SRI, they know. The guys at NIMH, notice guys, guys everywhere. Uh, this is a, a kind of self-definition that is totally disempowering. And shamans, all they trust is their own experience. And they don't even trust their memories of their own past experience. The world is made new, 
each time. So the felt presence of experience is all you'll ever know. It's all you ever can know. So why not empower it? And uh, and uh, the psychedelics do this. This is why they are so politically subversive. And a psychedelic person is not willing to be a good citizen or a good anything that is defined by somebody else. I mean, a shaman is a true anarchist, a truly free free soul, a real shaman. I mean, there are many, you know, we're always, there's the ideal, and then there's, like every other profession, uh, accommodations are made. But, but that's the ideal, to be truly in the moment, truly connected to the felt presence of experience. I was. Well, I think cannabis is a tremendously interesting and underrated uh, psychotropic. Mm-hmm. Most people who, sm- who smoke cannabis smoke it quite regularly. You rarely meet someone who says, I love cannabis, I smoke it four times a year. I've wrestled with this myself because there have been periods in my life, I kid you not, <laughs> when I used to set my alarm clock for three in the morning because I felt unable to go from midnight to 7 a.m. without smoking. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and what happens with that, if you smoke cannabis like that, you're in a kind of permanent state of uh, all you care about are big ideas. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're not very interested in getting a job or even cleaning your room, particularly. And I think this is completely defensible. I have no problem with that. Uh, My notion of what's ideal with cannabis is if one could have sufficient self-control, the perfect regimen with cannabis is, first of all, get the best stuff you can, and then once a week which is a groan to cannabis lovers. But that's because we're all using it for different purposes other than to plunge to the center of the mandala. But if you only smoke excellent cannabis and you only smoke it once a week and you sit down like on a Sunday evening, unplug the telephone, turn out the lights and smoke as much as you want as fast as you can, it, this is it's competitive with things considered to be much more powerful. As experiences because well, because of the irregularity of the supply, like I said, it's been about six months now since I'm getting it. Right? Well, so you've built up a tremendous charge for it. Uh, now, when I get to that point, normal and in fact, the fear of, of what I'm in front of or whatever is such that you know I put the thing out and I sit there and I white back the you know, try to maintain consciousness. Then it usually takes about a few minutes before that pineapple fades. And at that point, I just feel like I didn't get my struck, you know, until everything fades away. And would it be maybe, I mean, is there any danger in what I see the pineapple? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, the danger is your own tendency to panic. Yeah, because I don't know. But the cannabis is posing no problem. So <laughs> okay, because I I wondered about that before. Afterwards, what would happen if I had just closed my eyes and like gone into that pineapple room? That's what you should do. I mean, this raises the question about fear, which always arises. What do you do about fear? Well, people who claim they never experience fear around these psychotropics. <laughs> are not fully in touch with the modality of what's going on. Uh, yes, they have <laughs> And the, what do you do about fear? Uh, well, the best advice I ever heard was in, of all places, uh, Frank Herbert's book, Dune, <laughs> where, remember, they have this strange drug called Strewn, which allows them to see forward and backward into time. And he says in there, he says, fear comes like a wind. And what you must do is you must just let the wind blow. 
it's strange. It can't sustain itself yeah, it's very long. And weirdly enough, your mind will wander. You will actually become bored with being afraid. And you'll discover after a few minutes of being terrified that you've now your mind has wandered and now you're not terrified anymore. I When I do high-dose psychedelics, I just root myself to the floor. I have a rule of not moving yeah. because moving is a kind of distraction and to, and you, you have to go into it. But learning not to be afraid, it's easy to say, but it's hard to do. But you have to discipline the hind brain. It's the hind brain that presents you with this fight or flight yeah. thing. And you just have to say, hey, look, even yeah. this is neurocortex activity shut up already yeah, even in in the state i'm uh, there um the, there is an awareness that if i some, if something says if, if only i knew if this was okay or not kind of a thing but i think i think it's just the uh was not knowing it also helps to do the equivalent of praying mm-hmm. I, I mean i when i take mushrooms i say to it i say you know please don't hurt me I'm giving myself to you completely. You can kill me if you want, but please don't. You know, I'm... And now, it's a funny thing, of course, when you get out into these places, you have a whole bunch of... If you've done your homework, you have a bunch of scientific data to reassure yourself. I mean, let's take... Say you take eight... Let's say you take 10 grams of psilocybin and two hours into it, you convince yourself you're dying. Um, and then you say to yourself, but the LD50 of psilocybin is thus and so, and then you in the dark calculate, aha, uh-huh, so I would have had to have taken 900 times more than I actually took to actually kill myself. But this is a, this is a weak form of conjuring because I think most psychedelic people have the faith that actually chemistry represents a lesser truth. And the real truth is that the mind can kill you instantly if it chooses to. There's a terrifying passage in Jung, in Mysterium Junctiones, where he says, the psyche has a thousand ways of terminating a life which has become meaningless. You know, a slip in the hall, a step in front of an oncoming city bus, a moment of inattention, bingo, your compost. And so we have to honor the mind. The mind is in control, you know. Um, It's not easy to do this stuff. I mean, anybody who calls it escapism just is sort of pissing in the wind. They don't know what they're talking about. I mean, this is some of the toughest work that can be done. In the ancient world, um, the um, the Greeks thought that these deeps were those who would not be amenitri because they were thereby, and they were attacking the social outcasts, because they were hiding themselves from everybody else. They thought that only by becoming inebriated and stripping off the veneer of civilized decorum could you thereby see the real person inside, which is, of course, true. And the people that wouldn't do that were looked at with suspicion. And a few total orders in general, uh, I think, should be more <laughs> Yes, they're, they're frightened, anal, retentive didacts, and to be avoided in most situations. Uh, it's just the truth of the matter. Civilization is a, a diversion erected to escape the implications of psychedelic nature. You know, we build walls against it. We call it the howling wilderness. We say there are demons out there. Let's build whorehouses and public baths and hold circuses and uh, and at all costs, let us not find ourselves alone in nature with the mystery because it just peels you like a banana. <laughs> Most people, yeah, God, maybe you'd have to contemplate a true nature of arts. That's right. And so life is an endless series of uh, narcotic escapes, television, career, you know, you name it. Well, that's when we experience that have 
by us at the airport. of a lot of times that could be the IOS key would continue to block you, afraid to write the work you see. That the destination from that just be just you know, something else that you bring on the scene. She just that I was about to deploy where I thought I was going to die. You know, I was just shit there so hot. For some reason, somewhere in the back of my head, I vaguely remember it. And I did drink something when I'm sitting in my head, I think somewhere in the morning. And um, you just remember that, you know, some went off to wake up, you've already had corners, and I'm still alive. No, but like sometimes, I mean, some of the visions are horrifying. Time that you might watch these, see like, you know, like, People with their skin and strip bark or smells pying at you, blood. But it always seems to pass. Almost every eye was that especially hard. You always see like boat, and you're like, good, beautiful, it's in that piece. You're like, that's the night when you see. And a lot of the time, it's to me, she like, like, she liked her own glow or something. Like, she can be okay, but wherever she you do like that, like, you can hear about how hard you try to grasp on to something before. Okay. You just kiss. Sure. Well, as you gain experience, you can conquer the fear of death. However, what I think is more of a problem, especially to the true, the really dedicate, is the fear of madness. And this is a much more nebulous and not well understood phenomenon. And uh, you have to, it's incredibly humbling. Me, you have it will make you plead for mercy. It will rub your nose in it. People who have hubris can't do this very much or very long or very deeply because it won't tolerate it. I mean it can it can break you, it can break anybody. And so the only defense against that is a, a humble, a pure heart. That's what I mean when I say I pray to it and I say, you know, I know I'm an egomaniac. I know I'm, you know, way out of line. Please forgive me and please don't hurt me. And then, you know, there are techniques. The most effective technique is sing. Sing. And we Western people, when, when we get in there, the tendency when it gets rough is to clench and to go into a kind of a fetal, you know, this bit. This is not the way to do it. The way to do it is to begin to move oxygen and sound around and just sing your heart out, and you will be able to ride it through, and it, it will respond to that. The other thing is, when I do strong psychedelics, I always have cannabis rolled and ready, and I you view it as the rudder on the ship. And if I find myself sailing into, the, you know, there's one place that I call meat locker land. <laughs> and when I see that come up, I just, I don't wait. I just take a hit of cannabis and begin to sing. And then I can climb, you literally, you climb on the sound out of the hole toward the light. <laughs> and it's it's very demanding. I mean, it's very, very... Your whole soul, your whole being rests on being, there is no greater adventure. I mean, you know, people run around saying, oh, every jungle's been explored, every mountain climbed, you know, on a Saturday night in the confines of your own apartment, you can be Ferdinand Magellan if you wish. I mean, you can, you can see things no human eye has ever gazed on before or will ever gaze upon again. That's how big it is in there. And finally, you just have to trust the stuff and trust your own preparation. Every waking moment should be a preparation for the psychedelic experience. I mean, people should read books, look at works of art, uh, you know, have sexual experiences, travel, Spend time, you know, Robert Frost said the secret of life is learning to enjoy people you don't approve of. And <laughs> all of this, all of this, because you, you, you can't possibly be broadly enough educated to meet all the demands of the psychedelic experience. I mean, it is the challenge par excellence. 
and thus is the gates that is make find it there during you know, some weird like uh, the Sonoma or whatever. Uh, however dedicated you might be to this, or however interested or excited by it and so forth, um, there's also, I said before, there seems to be no end to human folly. There's also no end to human lazy. There are all these uh, West Burroughs called claims to be aging, nagging, posh, and striped flesh would always prevent you from that I, I you can talk to so big that I find myself that I'd not be something to be okay, you know, it's enough bullshit. It's kind of me to take something because uh you, you, you have claims of life itself or steer you invariably at least. How interested you are intellectually or emotionally of what kind of ecstatic experience you might have. Uh not thing that ecstasy is not found. Like Lawson said uh, your very soul is see and peak and you go a thing. And uh that's right. And and if you like I notice in myself, just in a, something as simple as cannabis, if I if I stop, if I stop, it's like my world just begins to narrow and narrow and I begin checking my bank balance. <laughs> I begin keeping track of my receipt. I begin wondering about my insurance situation. In other words, you're being, I'm turning into a, a jerk, a patsy, a, a member of this absurd society that we're living in. And I, I don't want that. I mean, that's why I call these things deconditioning agents, because the, the concerns of the petty bourgeois are not compatible with the psychedelic lifestyle. And, you know, everybody has to find their own balance. But a life lived without spirit is not really, to my mind, a life worth living. And it's... Well, that's one reason why the petty bourgeois is so voraciously against the... Because it, it challenges the, the worth of that style of, of being, worrying about your lawn, for God's sake, and <laughs> spending thousands of dollars on eliminating crabgrass, <laughs> and, uh, or maybe deciding you need a facelift or some other. I mean, this is just bananas, this kind of thing. <laughs> you know, another thing, back to the singer, um, I don't know how many people have. Rules with the ayahuasca, um, you saw carpets, but as far as that point, from there, I'll be a show still. But it's, um, every time I look, that the people joke ayahuasca, they always, the, the show will always sing. And, um, I do the song, you can do the, the whistle that they control, but they see, or at least they gain a more kind of a state of initial short than they are with the singing of the just And sometimes I've noticed when the guys are singing with. This will be like all of a sudden out of nowhere, like this like huge genius will appear right behind the guy. So he'll still come over that will be singing there with a shake in his right arm. Around his legs will be giant snakes and and Peter like, struggles rattle from his arms and not and the lightning bolts will be shooting out at the, in our direction. And then all of a sudden he'll just stop. He'll be said moment sure if you like like you mentioned, like sold like, it. Box and everything Tristan the dials will real, but then they'll start singing everything just unfolds and the visions are crystal clear and like you know certain things happen and it's just like through these songs they actually were able to like you know focus their attention on on you know on um on you know on, on well, whatever they're you know they're, they're trying to accomplish whether it's you know seeing inside the patient or whatever it may be but also at um various times i've been told like that in the morning after we because i was them when he talks about what they see and stuff and my west better films that told me that the spirit worlds were telling him, you must be like me. Well, you do what I do, they say. And now we're sort of somewhere in the corner of the same little seat, little balancing guy who's you know, some, something on that same run. And so, and um, it's not, you know, it's not unusual for these people to always want to be in that state either. You know, it's just like, I know some old Iowa's girls that drink it every other night. And it's like, that's the only world they really want to be in, you know? And it's just like, and at the same time, they never forget the responsibilities of the everyday reality. They're impeccable parents, usually, you know, they, it's amazing how, how much responsibility we can carry these people. Yeah, the responsibility for the health of the community and the dynamics of the community. But I would think to go to the grave without a psychedelic experience is like going to the grave without ever having sex. 
And it means that a major portion of what it is to be a human being, you just missed the point. And who knows how many opportunities we have to truly be. And so, you know, this is, this is a, a birthright. This is part of our heritage as beings in three-dimensional space. And it just cannot be, uh, it's not for governments to mess with it, any more than that they should regulate our sexuality or, or anything that is uh, basic to well, human beings. to do that before. Hey, if they could ban sex, they would. It's just they can't figure out any way to get rid of it. If they could, by God, and many have tried to the degree that they could. I mean, look at Puritanism. Look at the whole Western tradition, the incredible anxiety and guilt trips that have been laid. And even still, in, in current present-day laws, you look at how many, how many different they've broken into sex up into so many different acts of sex, and they've actually legislated against which ones you're supposed to be able to do and which ones you're not supposed to be able to do. It's ridiculous. Orgasm is a boundary-dissolving phenomenon very similar to psychedelic boundary dissolution. And boundary dissolution is terrifying to the dominator mentality. This is why in French, orgasm is uh, the little death, the petit mort. It's the little death. You know, what a strange approach to the most vital activity that we can do. But it's because... You know, dominators, too, have to get their rocks off, but they approach it with this tremendously phobic attitude. You know, it's unclean, it's contaminating, it must be done in darkness, it must <laughs> never be publicly discussed. It's the shameful fact of our fleshiness uh, is just uh, confounding to the dominator. And uh, similarly, uh, the dimensions of, of the mind spend too much time on it, but there seemed to be some appetite for it before breakfast is, and, and this is in a way it's highly idiosyncratic and there may be people here who violently disagree with me. And if they do, I hope they don't remain silent. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not fragile. I come from Berkeley. We throw chairs <laughs> when we disagree. <laughs> uh, but I thought it would be interesting, or, or I would just like to tell you my uh, how I see. I always I think that it's legitimate to try and make sense of things. Some people say, "Well, you just must accept. You don't try to understand it." But I really get a kick out of understanding it's, it's a high in itself and so i want to know you know we here we are aficionados of the psychedelic experience we imply that it could change history maybe save the world so the real question that has to be answered is what's so great about it are we better people than people who don't do this is this really, uh, you know, what's so great about it? Or are we no different than Scientologists, Mormons, uh, Hindus, anybody who's got some set of interlocking explanations that make it all make sense for them? And my model for what's going on is uh, a geometric one. I mean, I'm enough of, enough in the Western scientific tradition to believe in the primacy of mathematical description, that somehow that cuts deeper than, than verbal metaphor. <laughs> so I, I believe that consciousness, as we ordinarily experience it, it's evolved over millions of years of pre-human existence and then human experience into a, uh, a device, a detection system to preserve the body. It's a, consciousness is a, somatic detect, is a somatic protective adaptation. Uh, you know, s insects exude uh, toxins. Uh, jaguars have claws and teeth. We think, and it's a way to, uh, it's an aid in survival. But it has become that through the 
um, exigencies and constraints of three-dimensional space in a fairly dangerous environment because our bodies are soft, easily destroyed, easily mangled. And so consciousness has become a protective shell that you, we use to think our way through life and avoid danger. But in and of itself, consciousness, I think, is something else. It, when you, that's why I say the way to take psychedelics is, and people argue this, I, I think the best way to do it is in a situation of near sensory deprivation, I say silent darkness. And people say, yes, but it's so wonderful to wander stoned in the woods. Yes, it is, but it is never as intense as what can be achieved when exterior input is restricted. And when exterior input is restricted, I think that consciousness literally, literally unfolds into a higher dimension, into a kind of hyperspace or superspace. This is why the shaman can see inside someone's body. You can't see inside someone's body unless you're in, an, in a higher dimension. If you're in a higher dimension, the inside and the outside of someone's body is equally accessible. Do you all understand what I mean? That if you're in hyperspace, there's no such thing as a locked box. And there's no such thing as the inside and outside of a body. Similarly, the shaman can see who stole the chicken. Or the shaman can see who sent the, the virote, the tensak, the poison dart. Because, in fact, the shaman transcends linear time and space. One definition of who, what a shaman is... It, and the mushroom told me this. I said, what is a shaman? And the mushroom said, a shaman is someone who has seen the end. No hesitation. A shaman is someone who has seen the end. What that means is that here we are down in three dimen the three-dimensional space-time matrix with the, the conscious mind bound into the body. But when we basically anesthetize or de-emphasize the body and allow consciousness to unfold to its own parameters, then it obviates time and space. It obviates the inside and the outside of things. It is an authentic journey into a superspace that can be mathematically analyzed if necessary. And what came up before breakfast this morning was, you know, I've been grappling with this DMT thing since 1967. And uh, uh, the, the puzzling part of it, the challenging, the epistemically challenging part of it, are the entities. I mean, that's big news. I mean, a hallucination is one thing, an intellectual insight is one thing, but beings... I mean, that's, that's something quite of a different order. Well, let's try and be, if not scientific, at least have a certain rational economy to our thinking on this subject, and let's take it seriously. Let's say that, yes, we agree that on DMT in the flash, one encounters beings that have a great affection for humanity and a wish to communicate with them. Now, uh, a, a spectrum of explanation offers itself in line with the current obsessions of our culture. The first thing we might suppose is, my God, these are extraterrestrials that are somehow available through this alteration of consciousness. Now, extraterrestrials are a hypothetical construct. Nobody has ever trotted one around. The people who believe in extraterrestrials without question invariably vibrate with the same kind of narrow-minded, uh, opinionated 
aura that you get with Christian fundamentalism or anybody who has all the answers. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that these are extraterrestrials because, you know, the distances between the stars are incomprehensibly vast and the time that is involved is incredible. And, you know, of course, there could be instantaneous technologies, but I said we would have a certain rational economy in our explanation. Okay, so extraterrestrials, that's one possibility. Next possibility, um, we know from those of us who are aficionados of science fiction that within the 20th century, the concept has been booted around of what's called a parallel continuum. In other words, that somehow there are worlds different from this world that lie side by side to ours, and that you can, uh, in some, in that hypothetically through some technological innovation or through magic or something, you can contact these parallel continua. However, no one has ever convincingly demonstrated the existence of it. Well, so then if we use what is called Occam's razor, which is a, a very um, respected logical um, a, a limitation used in the formation of hypotheses to keep things from getting too baroque, Occam's razor simply says hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. In other words, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, if it doesn't have to be complicated, why complicate it? So if we try to apply Occam's razor to the entities encountered on DMT, then it seems to me far more likely, and nevertheless incredibly challenging to our conceptions of reality, far more likely that than that these entities are extraterrestrials or dwellers in some hypothetical parallel continuum, a more economical hypothesis would be that these are souls. After all, they love us, they're very interested in us, and they seem to be somehow right here. They are souls. And what you break into is an ecology of souls. Well, now, we, I think, far more than most of us realize, have bought in to the um, or premise of materialism, which is that when you die, you become compost, and that's it. But a crowd like this... We just run around constantly giving praise to shamans and shamanism and saying, you know, they're so far out, they cure, they know more than we do, uh, they have a better connection into nature. Well, then, when we ask the shamans, what do they say about these entities? Well, they say that they're ancestors. They say, well, they're, it's the spirit world. They're ancestors. We do all our magic through the ancestors. Ancestors is a tremendously cleaned up concept. What they're talking about is dead people. An ancestor is a dead person, for crying out loud. Whoever heard of an ancestor who wasn't a dead person? <laughs> so if we have such respect and reverence for the insights of shamanism, then we are going to have to take seriously a fairly confounding notion to our materialist point of view, which is when you smoke DMT, you encounter souls that, in fact, uh, death has no sting. <laughs> And that the metamorphosis of conscious life occurs beyond the grave. And I find I resisted this for years. I just pushed it away as too weird. Better they should be extraterrestrial meme traders come here to do X, Y, and Z. 
better, it should be a parallel continuum. But shaman worldwide insist that they are the ancestors. What can we bear, bring to bear against that? 500 years of scientific rationalism that has produced a neurotic world population and a toxified planet. If we, you know, this is where the humility comes in, I think. We have to seriously consider the possibility that, uh, as Marcel Ayad says in his wonderful study, Shamanism, the Archaic Techniques of Ecstasy, he says, the shaman is one who can pass through the same gate that the dead pass through every day, but the shaman returns. The shaman returns. Well, this just raises the hackles on the back of my neck because now we're beginning to get answers. This is not instant psychotherapy. This is not an elaborate form of self-indulgent play. This is getting down to the most bedrock stuff there can possibly be. We are gaining insight within our own intellectual constructs into what lies beyond the grave. And this is the, in all the science fiction scenarios of what the future held, colonies on Mars, physical immortality, nanotechnology, star flight, nothing could be as confounding to 20th century secular civilization as the discovery of what lies beyond organic life. And maybe it's because I had to, I've always been uh, obsessed with Lepidoptera and have spent many years observing them, but I see now, Jonathan showed last night the statue of Zochopinle, the butterflies there, the butterfly even to the Greeks, was the symbol of psyche. The butterfly is the symbol par excellence of metamorphosis. And so I think that what we are on the brink of learning as a culture is that our terror of death is a misapprehension of how the universe works. I mean, we're like caterpillars contemplating pupation and saying, my God, nothing could be worse. No longer will I chew on the cabbage leaves. No longer will I spend my time moving around on the underside of foliage. Instead, something horrible and unimaginable. I don't want to become a chrysalis and lie still and exhibit no sign of life. But then, and the caterpillar never notices, unless there are shaman caterpillars, <laughs> that what are these miraculous creatures moving through the air in a cloud of exultant iridescence? It is the human soul and the mystery of human becoming. And this, to my mind, Dahlia challenged me after the talk the other day where we got into some pretty existential stuff, you know, what is the basis of hope? The basis of hope is that the, the teaching of teachings of shamanism is that death is an illusion of the material mind and that life is, as the Buddhists, the Dzogchen people, the shamans, as all the old, old earth-centered, rooted philosophies teach, life must be a preparation for the transition to another dimension. Now, I, this, I, God, I never thought I would have come to this place. <laughs> I mean, I plot my way free of the Catholic Church, and it's clearly not necessary. I, I'm fascinated by Timothy Leary. He's a, he's a personal friend of mine. There is not an iota of spiritual sensitivity in the man. I mean, he will tell you this. Uh, you've probably all heard him say, God, fuck God. You know, I mean, it's something he loves to do in front of audiences. Uh, he's a behavioral psychologist from Harvard, even 40 years and 10 trillion mi micrograms later. But uh, uh, I, I think that this is the big news. And remember when I said the other day in our heavy discussion, 
that we have to learn to die with dignity. I didn't mean just fold your tent and sink into the quicksand, embracing the idea that there's a noble destiny in becoming ant food. I meant uh, we should realize that life is an opportunity to prepare our vehicle for transition into eternity. And the urgency that is now coming out of the plant and out of uh, all of this is because, remember how I said 95% of all species have become extinct? Apparently, nature is a mechanism for producing extinct species. I think that uh, consciousness is the precondition for immortality. And that, I mean, and I'm just basically, I'm, this is the name of this talk is what I've learned from psychedelics or something like that. <laughs> And that the the purpose of life is to become conscious and to strengthen consciousness. Uh, William Blake has he says that he says after death there is a golden spiral into eternity, but not all can traverse the golden spiral. And then he says if you fall from the golden spiral, then there is eternal death. Well, I choose to believe that if you attain incarnation as a human being, then you are a caterpillar, and you do have then a, a very, very good or perhaps a 100% opportunity for making this transition. And the urgency that surrounds this now is I, I, I share all of your concerns for the environment for the starving, for the AIDS infected, for all the horror around us. But I also believe nature has a higher wisdom than any of us can generate or bring to bear. And that in fact, nothing is wrong. Nothing is wrong. Everything is on track. And that we are in fact headed for extinction as three-dimensional animals. And, that, uh, and that's why shamanism and the archaic revival and the discovery of the old, old knowledge, knowledge which was useless inside the enterprise of civilization, now has meaning because the enterprise of civilization is finished. And Merci Eliade, in another book, a book called Myth, Dreams, Myths, Dreams, and Mysteries, has a wonderful passage where he compares Western civilization to a dying person. And he says, when a person dies, their entire existence flashes in front of them. And when a, when a global culture dies, everything is flashing in front of us. Every codex will be published. Every archaeological site will be dug up and displayed. Every philosophy will be trotted out and explored because we are in the delirium that precedes transition into the next dimension. And if we can, through the use of psychedelics, create a shamanic understanding where you know, and I think that's what we're doing. That's what this circle is. But millions of people, billions of people need the um, calming assurance that comes from experientially verifying the existence beyond the grave. And I think that at the end of history, this is what will happen, that very shortly, the the instability built into the system is going to transform material existence beyond all imagining. The culture, the, the global civilization is dying. There are too many problems. They're accumulating. You have to be blind to not realize that this is really, in fact, the end of the road and that it is... Um, you know, the ozone hole, the toxic pollution, the toxification of the ocean, 
we can't pretend that these things are easily reversed by simply recycling or something like that. No, instead of this clutching to keep it all like it is and say, oh, no, no, please, no future, please, no future, we have to say, okay, deep breath. It's like that first wave of psilocybin when you feel it sweep over you or ayahuasca. And you realize, you know, my God, my God, here it comes. I've done it this time. <laughs> well, we've done it this time, folks. We have been planning human mass suicide for 15,000 years. Not a moment was not dedicated to this goal. And now it's upon us. And it's a, a cause for great rejoicing. We will go off into hyperspace. The planet will heave an enormous sigh of relief. <laughs> and if it can come back from an asteroid impact that leaves nothing larger than a chicken standing around, then I dare say in 50, 60,000 years, you know, the glaciers will run, the jungles will restabilize, the ocean will cleanse itself. And as the I Ching says, no blame, no blame. And the metaphor that we have to keep in front of ourselves, you know, you, you all know the cliche uh, ontogeny recapitulate phylogenal, right? Do we all understand what this means? No. It, it, it's, it means it's something that embryologists in the 19th century created, and I think it's fairly profound. It's that a fetus, a human fetus, uh, recapitulates the entire history of evolution on this planet. It begins as a tiny one-celled organism. It becomes a fish. It becomes a reptile. It becomes a mammal. It becomes a human being. But the part of the recapitulation of phylogeny that we've ignored is extinction. For, for a million years, we have been uh, afloat in the gentling amniotic ocean of the planetary environment. Imagine the fetal crisis of birth. You exist as a fetus inside your mother. Food is delivered through the umbilical cord. Oxygen delivered the same way. Endless space, weightlessness. The dream, paradise. All needs are met. And then something begins to go wrong. <laughs> the walls close in. The, and you begin to be propelled into the birth canal. Strangulation. Death. The fetus must know at that moment incredible fear. Everything is going to be destroyed. The world is ending. But yet, how could the fetus at that moment, imagine Hieronymus Bosch or nuclear physics or global politics or star flight or any of these things. We are now in the birth canal of a new ontological order of human existence, and the walls are closing in. There's no going back. The amniotic ocean, the, the un polluted, endless frontier of a game-rich planet? Forget it. We've been in the birth canal for 10, 15,000 years, and now we're approaching transition, the most violent part of the birthing process. And all you can do is scream unless you have some superordinate knowledge of what is going on. The shamans, shamans in the rainforest, shamans among us, uh, and as a goal for each of us, must act as the midwives to a new order of existence. There's no going back. We've burnt this scene to the ground, and the womb is stretched, the womb is traumatized, but it can recover, And but the, the child and the mother must be parted. Again, the metaphor of pregnancy. If the pregnancy is somehow um, doesn't, if the birth is not smooth, if the child is not parted from the mother, toxemia sets in. 
And then both, and then you have a real crisis: the life of the mother, the life of the child. Everything is in danger. This is the re- this is a, the real problem. I don't think we've reached that place yet. I think that we'll go fairly smoothly into hyperspace. But I think the emergence in the last twenty years of uh, masses of human beings taking psychedelics, masses of human beings talking about getting in touch with the spirit, talking about a, a new shamanism, an archaic revival. This means we are very, very close to seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And it's a radiance, the, the, the meaning and the depth of which cannot be told, because we are, after all, being born into a higher dimension. But if we believe in the dynamics of nature, if we believe in the rightness of being, then there should be no anxiety. There should be no alarm. This is what psychotherapy and shamanism and all these things exist for, is to spread the truth about the situation so that we don't clutch and we don't hold on and spread panic and hysteria. Uh, and that's what I've learned from psychedelic. Uh, to get to the spirit, I can't see for myself, I can't be bypassing the heart. Um, but anyway, well, don't you think that that the collapse of everything familiar is going to open our hearts? I mean, look at what AIDS has done. Uh, look at what our the information we have about the rainforest or the pictures of Somalia. I mean, the the most open-hearted of us open first. But before this is over, every one of us will probably bury the dead and walk through, I mean, it, hell. And it will open the heart. It can't fail to open the heart. I mean, when a friend dies in your arm, maybe the first time it doesn't work, but the second, the third, the fourth, I mean, we are going to get it sooner or later. And it's, it's bigger than all of us. I mean, it's just so big. And it's always been there in miniature in the phenomenon of our own deaths. But we, didn't, we don't look at that. But, you know, if you will contemplate your own death, your heart will open. I mean, the truth that I've learned from psychedelics, to put it into bumper sticker form, <laughs> if that's the way to think of it, is... Uh, this is the hardest truth there is. This is the distillation of 50,000 years of, of, of nomadic hunting and orgies around the campfire and rockets to the moon and, and the whole thing. It can be summed up in a single phrase. Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. Everything is changing into something else. Heraclitus said this. He said, Pante Reyes, all flows. Uh, we flow into this world, we inhabit it, and we move on. Nothing lasts, not your career, not your fortune, and finally, not even your own sweet self. Everything is replaced. And if we can open ourselves to this by the heart, by the by the mind i mean there's all ways then we will find the dignity to and and this is not about being born in the generation at the end of the world this is something that would have worked at every moment in history after all heraclitus lived 2500 years ago this is the truth of true maturity nothing less i mean every time i i take a trip or or eat a fine meal or make love or visit an art gallery, I feel the transience of it, and that enriches it. That's the heart dimension, is the poignancy of knowing that this too shall pass. This too shall pass. You know, the earliest piece of poetry in English is called Deor's Lament, and it begins... Nine winters we Elfiao held Maringlenburg. That now is gone. This too shall pass. It was a song sung by a poet to a king somewhere in, in France in, in, the, in the 10th century or something like that. 
everything is in transition and uh, the material body can resists this truth because the material body understands that if it passes then it will be replaced by something which it can imagine and that that triggers a, an anxiousness but i think this is what psychedelics teach that uh, nothing nothing lasts and if we can incorporate that and live it we will live every moment to its fullest the people who are hiv positive they get to walk around with the knowledge that nothing lasts and in a way they are privileged because after all any one of us could be bitten by a snake today and die or have a tree fall on us or be run over by a bus we would have missed living in that heartful dimension where you know that you 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 too will uh, will move from the scene and make way for something else Terence, if I could use the example, because I've been in the HIV community a lot, that when a good friend of mine was dying, I took both my sons to his deathbed because I really felt that they needed to be there. And um, we stayed with my friends you know, for a few hours. So you, it's a touch, you know, he uses the body, you know, moving. And yeah, the next day we came back and we died. I'm part of a tradition where we're all trying to learn how to make that transition beautiful. And so they had his body the next day with painted with fabulous. And they kept it in the house for almost uh, almost two day acres. While people came and they went through whatever they had to go through. And my youngest son, Jacob, um, came up and he was very quiet. And I said, I want to check in with you. This is very intense. And I said, what, what do you feel? And he said, he went inside me. You know, and it was something that I've been experiencing more and more now, this internal turning it was like something I shared with you about a theory ceremony where I felt this bird flying around inside me and then I went inside and there was a whole uh, environment that's pristine and I was crying and crying and, and the voice kept saying, we're not extinct, we came inside. All right. There's a whole environment somehow. I mean, I don't understand it yet. And I think psychedelics, like we say, are some kind of bridge that perils for like people. But I know in my own experience of going through so many of my friends' death and you see a man... This is idol, 25, beautiful man turned into an Auschwitz-like character, this little fetal being in a bed, and it's terrifying. But at the same time, you go through that enough, and it's almost like a rehearsal for resurrection. Just Yeah, William Blake said, um, nothing is lost. Nothing is lost, and I, I really believe that. I think we only move on. But William Blake, you know, this isn't the opposite thought, but it's an adumbration of it. He said, what is the price of experience? Is it bought for a song or sold for a dance in the street? No, it is purchased with all that a man has. His children, his wife, his home. And that's the truth of it. One of the things that you learn on psychedelics that you haven't mentioned at all that ties into this a lot is time wave zero and you haven't mentioned it here at all uh, Are you, is that a, do you, well the uh, the um, any, the reassurances of higher mathematics I figured I would spare you well, would you favor us with uh, I, I've always been interested in where you've drawn historic parallels to uh, kind of checking in on where we're at in well I, I you know i said a shaman is someone who has seen the end mm. and i mean that on many many levels but um for some reason and i don't know why although jonathan said something last night i'm not sure i can quote it exactly but he can help me pasteur said Chance favors the informed mind. The feared mind. The prepared mind. Chance favors the prepared mind. I, I, my trip have taken the form of a mathematical modeling of reality that incorporates all of these emotional perceptions into the idea that... Um, you know, there is a natural order to time, 
and in the same way that a pregnancy has a, a, a describable unfolding, human history has a describable unfolding. And we can, if we pay sufficient attention to the, to the content of the psychedelic experience, and if we have prepared our mind, and in this case it happens to mean by gaining familiarity with the previous system for describing time, the I Ching, that the, the ecology of souls beyond death can actually give us a map and, and a map of history showing where it begins, where it climaxes, and where it ends. I think that to some degree the Maya had this. I think great civilizations have this sense of an inner dynamic, and uh, I think it's built into the DNA. You know, in, in Moby Dick, when Starbuck and Ahab are discussing the pursuit of the whale, and Ahab says to him, he says, this story was old 10,000 years before the oceans rolled. I think this story was old a million, million years ago, and that we are on schedule, on track, and, if, and it's our job to prepare our minds and then to uh, make a kind of peace with it. And the, the, what the psychedelics offer is nature is offering reassurance and saying, if you will but turn away from the masturbatory activities of secular civilization, all nature seeks to speak to you of the completion, of the plan, of the glorious hope that lies ahead. The Irish, a perverse race if there ever was one, <laughs> have a wonderful toast, and it is... May you be alive at the end of the world. <laughs> and uh, I think we, 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 we won the jackpot. <laughs> you know, we, we get to be the most privileged generation of all the thousands and thousands stretching back and back and back because we, get to, we have ringside seats for a drama that was ancient before the ice melted. Uh, let me, as long as, let me try and get a, off this heavy thing for a minute and tell you something about the Irish that I think sheds a little bit of light on DMT. Uh, as, you, as you know, the Irish uh, have, a, 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 if we think in cultural stereotypes, uh, two things that are associated with the Irish invariably are uh, intoxication and little people. And uh, some of you may know uh, that in Christian theology, there is the concept of purgatory. And purgatory is uh, where unbab the souls of unbaptized children are thought to go. And it's exactly like heaven except that you don't get the sight of God because you were died unbaptized. I mean, this is just their dogma. Well, I always assume that, uh, that the doctrine of purgatory arose probably at the Council of Nicaea, or I just hadn't given it much thought. And then I was asked to write an introduction to a reprint of uh, Y.E. Evans Vence's book, The Fairy Faith in Celtic Countries, which is a wonderful ethnographic study of fairy beliefs in Brittany, Scotland, and Wales. Mm -hmm. And I had not read the book since I was 14, so I read it again, and I learned there to my amazement that um, the doctrine of purgatory was created when Patrick arrived in Ireland to convert the pagan Irish to Christianity. He found this fairy faith just very strong, and it was a belief that when you die, you, you go into a dimension very nearby. In fact, all around, 
and you continue in some kind of existence, having parties and drinking under hills and making magical objects and stuff. And, uh, and the belief in Ireland is that certain people can see the fairies. If you have what's called the eye, you can see the fairies. And the people who have the eye say they're all around. They're everywhere. There are thousands of them. They just fill nearby space. Where Patrick told, he told them then, he created the doctrine of purgatory. And when he successfully converted the pagan Irish and returned to Rome and filed his report, uh, they were so impressed with the success of his missionary work that they made it general church dogma, and then they used it very successfully in the Slavic conversions in the East. So purgatory is really fairyland shoved into an uncomfortable accommodation with Christian dogma, but it is the, 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 the basis of both belief is the same phenomena which are revealed under DMT, the presence of a nearby space filled with entities with an affection and concern for humanity.